So where are my slides? Okay, I guess I want to start here maybe. Um, so you guys did your lab or you're in the process of doing your lab. Um, I want to just go through quickly a couple of things that, that uh, would maybe have been more clear had I done, had I not skipped the uh, statistics lab and given you guys a break. Um, so one of, the, one of the things we want to, uh, to look at is we want you guys to have your projects set up uh, on, uh, uh, on Arcos. Um, just because that, that gives us the opportunity to, to maintain and, and watch and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, ha have other people join you in subsequent semesters, et cetera. So, you know, we do want to have you guys in that kind of place. So if you go to arcos.io, um, I'll just pop, pop up another little thing here. You can go to arcos.io slash projects. Um, if you don't have uh, if you don't have an account, you'll have to sign up for an account. Just put yourself in. Use your RPI email address, and it will automatically let you in. Uh, you can see that I'm not using my RPI email address, so I have some special stuff going on underneath the covers that allow me to uh, to to kind of work like this. But um, you will, if you just use your RPI address, you will be good. You can come in here and declare yourself as a developer. Um, and come in and declare yourself uh, as active. How do we do that? Um, my, my screen is a little different than yours because I have special privileges. Let's see if I edit my own profile. There we go. If you edit your profile, you can mark yourself as an active developer. Once you've done that, you have access to the projects or you have access to the projects anyway. Uh, but once you're in the system, you can add a project Right. Put in your GitHub repository, you know, give us some, some names and things like this. And this is what we're talking about um, on setting up your projects. And once you do that, you'll see that you have the ability to do a blog. Right. You can come in and add a post to the blog. Right. So you can come in and do this on your projects and describe everything that you're doing. And that's kind of what's being referenced in this um, this document. So go in. It's really simple. It's pretty intuitive to set yourself up, but go in, make yourself an account on Arcos.io. Um, that Arcos.io is called Observatory. That's the software that runs uh, runs Arcos um, at least for the next month. We are trying to introduce uh, a new version called Telescope, and hopefully we will be able to migrate all of this stuff. We will be able to migrate all this stuff because that is the one. Uh, bright and shining signposts that I've put in the ground as being required. Um, but hopefully uh, we will succeed on that sooner rather than later. Um, but just go into there and, and set up your projects. Um, in your lab group, in your lab then, give project name, link to your blog, link to your GitHub repository of your project, list of collaborators on the project. Um, and once a week, I would like you, once a week, each person on your project should commit, um, should, should begin uh, blogging. Just a quick, um, we call it a status update, but just tell us what you've been working on, uh, what you, you know, how, how far you've gotten, any, any blockers you've run into, and, uh, and you know, links to commits if you have them. Um, all right. So that is that. And I should have made this a little bit more explicit, but this is just something that I want you guys to, to go through and make sure you can handle. All right. And you should see that in your, in your lab for this week, you should have something about doing a blog, making a blog post. And that all refers to, to kind of this. All right. Um, any questions? Start off with any questions. Not seeing any questions. Okay, we can we can go on from there if necessary. Um, I just want to lay out kind of what's going on right now. We are three weeks from the end of presentations, and then we'll enter 
our project presentation phase. Um, I'm planning on giving you all about 10 minutes per project. I'm hoping to uh, give three separate presentation days. So if you figure uh, 10 minutes per project, um, there are about 21 projects. That's about 210 minutes. Um, we'll have a little time in there for questions. Uh, you know, there's always a little wasted time getting between them. So after these interim reports, work really hard for the next three or four weeks, and then uh, you'll do your final presentation, which will wrap up and be a, have a lot more results than what this current presentation has. Um, and that's the end of the semester. We don't have a final, I don't believe. No, we don't have a final. Um, I'll give you some more pointers on what I want in your final presentation. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, I had originally planned to do presentations at the end of class, but I think with my habit of running over allotted time, I think what we'll do is we'll jump right into presentations for today. So let's, uh, let's start off. Do we have uh, coolies? Um, I'm not actually seeing them here. All right, we will skip that person from now. Uh, O'Connor Four R Four. Are you Are you here? Are you ready to do your uh, your little talk or talk? It doesn't have to be little. Well, it has to be little somewhat. Ah, Christine, could you, if you are either join the stage, or um, join the stage, or, uh, or or raise your hand, and I'll invite you to the stage. We are all set to have you to have you go. Are you ready? I'm not putting you on the spot at all, am I? No issues. All right. Um, while we're waiting for Christina, how about Orlang 2? Do we have Orlang 2 here? Ah, here we go. Somebody's coming in. Gabriel Orlansky. You ready? Hey, uh, Go ahead. Uh, let me share my screen. Please. Just like everyone so, else, I'll, I'll run about oh. a three-minute timer. Um, and there's no, it's not a, you know, it's not a hard out, but it'll just let you know when you're getting close. Um, and, uh, and please, Alan NLP, love this. Yeah, so uh, I'm presenting on Allen NLP. Um, just quick, uh, a quick recap. It's a natural language processing framework for developing uh, deep learning models, specifically for research. Um, so currently, I've been working on implementing a data set reader for a popular uh, data set as part of a larger benchmark. And so I've currently been working on a better understanding of the library as a whole, designing the reader itself, and working on the implementation. Um, I did split the repo from a fork because the fork had a lot of issues on my computer in terms of loading, but that's a separate issue. So it's in its own um, development repo. So just a quick overview of the framework itself is that it's supposed to be as lightweight as possible for researchers. So they have to worry about the least writing like less code in terms of whether it be different training loops, different trainers. So all you, really someone has to do in a very basic sense is all they have to do is they write, have to write the reader and they have to write the model. And then through a JSON file like this and the command from Allen NLP, it will run the entire training loop and train your model. It's very lightweight, but one of the biggest downsides of this approach is that it's really hard to debug your code and to understand if you're looking at examples, what's really happening. 
so that's so it did take some time to learn how it works and different ways in which you can create these JSONs. And so after learning more about the data set, I moved on to the main task, which is implementing the reading comprehension with common sense reasoning data set from the Zhang et al. paper. Um, it uses CNN and Daily Mail articles and their summaries. Then finally, every single one of these passages has a question and it has a corresponding answer, which is going to be a text span from the summary. And on the right, you see the different types of reasoning tasks that are included inside this data set. And it's part of the overall overarching benchmark of SuperGlue, which stands for Super General Language Understanding Evaluation. That was created by NYU and Facebook Research. So currently for the data set reader, it has to be compatible with the already implemented transformer question answering model. model. Um, and during development, I really put an emphasis on documentation because of the difficulties with understanding uh, how these models work and how these readers work just due to the JSON configs. But the main issue that I've run into currently is that the inputs of the record data set do not align with the transformer QA model. And so it's been trying to figure out how to get the entities in and figure out how to get the answers in and choosing an answer. So currently I've completed is reading the data files, um, tokenizing all the different fields, whether that be the answers or the, the queries, and then also getting the context window for the answers. And just very briefly what the context windows are is that these transformer models are based off of a recent paper and they have a, and, and while they're faster in terms of lookup, they have a quadratic uh, complexity for memory usage. So you can only use text that are 512 tokens long. So when you're doing question answering or reading comprehension, you need to use a, the a context window um, from the overarching passage to make sure you don't go over the 512. And so basically what you do is you just find where the answer is and you select a bit before and a bit after in the, the context. So the main goals are to finish this implementation and that includes the metrics and the tests for that and to create a working example using Google Collab with the JSON um, notebooks. And finally, uh, the unit test integration test for the reader. And hopefully, if there's time to implement another one of the data sets from the super glue benchmark, which is pictured on the right. Nice. Um, so what you said you were doing this for a, uh, OK, you're doing this for a well understood model. Is this the Google Colab model? Um, so the well understood model is a transformer. Okay. Itself, and then Google Collab. It's just Jupyter notebooks, but you can use Google's uh, GPUs. Okay. Got it. So it still is kind of open source, but somewhat. Yeah, there's a. There are a lot of uh, gradations of of open, and it's always kind of fun to to, to kind of dig down and, and work on those. I think next week we'll well next week we'll. Yeah, I think next week we'll do databases, and uh, we'll actually do we're going to actually do Mongo, which isn't open anymore. Um, and we're going to do it because of this excellent gradations and the, to get some discussion started, hopefully. So, so good, good point. All right. Thank you. Any questions for, for Gabriel? All right. Uh, it looks like Christina's here. Christina, do you want to, uh, replace? Hi, can you, can you hear me? We can hear you very nicely. Okay. Um, coming through clear. Um, and, and by the way, the next one up is Kian M. So if you want to join just like Christina did, that seems to be maybe the uh, the best way to go. We are learning something every day. Hi. Um, so I'm Christina Lino, and I'm working with Rylan O'Connell on an EEG lab plugin called Buoy. Um, and the reason it's called Buoy is because Buoy kind of, they Does just kind of like are in, oh, can you, sorry? Do you have slides to share or? Yeah, oh wait, oh sorry, wait, can you not see the slides? No, I, oh, cannot, no. I cannot see the slides. Oh, I'm so sorry, I thought I was no, sharing the slides. That's not an issue, that's why I reminded you. Oh, okay, sorry, there's. There we go, now I'm seeing something, now I'm seeing. Oh, I think what you did was you shared. Yeah, there we go. I think what you did was you shared uh, the entire screen, which was sharing your view of 
Nook, <laughs> which was just showing my screen. Okay. You're good now. Okay. Um, and if I present, you can see that? Or... Perfectly clearly. That is beautiful. Okay. Although that guy looks so... like he's uh, in pain. Maybe not. <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, sorry. So I'm uh, I'm working on this with Raylan O'Connell. We're the two contributors to Bowie, which is an EEG Lab plugin. Um, and the reason it's called Bowie is because it's like buoys just kind of are in the ocean and they can be used to detect like information about waves. And what this plugin is meant to do is it's meant to be a series of functions that can identify different brain waves given a set of EEG data or multiple sets of EEG data. Um, and what an EEG is, is it's essentially a cap that goes over a person's skull and there are electrodes that, that are connected to it. And those electrodes record like the the brain waves from a person and other electrophysiological data. So Bowie is under the GPL3 license um, and we have an issue tracker that uh, has issues with that are both like meant for new beginners and like things that will eventually be more complex. And we have established contri contributor guidelines and an appropriate like, code of conduct with that contribution guidelines. Um, we communicate through Discord, and our repository is on GitHub. Uh, this, this, these plugins will just be uh, written in MATLAB because that's what EEG Lab is written in. Um, and we'll also be using some open source tools to get to get this working, um, like Open Neuro and other open data sets. So I wanted to include an example of what I'm talking about when I when I'm say EEG data like so there are brain waves that we can we can look at this and identify that oh this is a sleep spindle which is a particular type of brain wave and human annotators can like look at the data and identify that and record it and it's it's often tedious work so what this is meant to do is automate how sleep spindles are recorded or K complexes and like all the other types of brain waves that happen during sleep. Um, and currently we have spent the first week primarily doing background research um, where we were looking at existing EEG lab plugins and tutorials on how to use EEG lab because we haven't really had a lot of experience with MATLAB going into it. We've, it, there's been a lot of trial and error and also actually gathering the existing data sets for the EEG are actually a bit of work because the data sets are quite large and there's there are certain tools that need to be used in order to even like open them up. Uh, so recently we've been working on developing a hello world like equivalent of an EEG lab plugin um, so that we can like get used to MATLAB and we're expanding the plugin to gather to, to test like one specific type of brainwave that occurs during stage two sleep. Um, so uh, currently there's been a lot of uh, research and like documenting that process on the repo. Um, and eventually we will have uh, a set of functions that can record different types of brainwaves. Cool. Yeah. All right. Is that your, uh, that's your end or you have more? Um, that, that is our end. That's okay. It was a soft end. I didn't, I didn't know whether you had, you, you had finished or not. All right. So, uh, very cool. Um, so where did you get this idea from? Just, um, I've always been interested in computational neuroscience and, um, when I was doing the paper analysis I, for, for, um, when I was doing the term paper, I found this website that had like open data sets. Mm -hmm. And cool. um, there, yeah, there's a lot of automation. They're, they're, they're trying to find ways to automate how to process these data sets because currently it's like a very time consuming process. Yeah. So, so I'm going to throw out that I've done a lot of signal processing with FFTs. Um, those look remarkably like uh, uh, some of the, the webs, you know, some of the signals we would, we would uh, get through on that, um, you know, where you would apply an FFT to get a, to get a frequency and, uh, and side lobes and things. Um, yeah, because I think EEGs do use t uh, FFTs. I would expect they would. <laughs> so, so that's yeah. kind of that's kind of cool. It looks it looks very familiar to uh, something I used to do. Well, to signal processing that I used to do uh, decades ago. Um, we also a few semesters back we had somebody from uh, the uh, the big 
ship looking building on SUNY Albany campus uh, who does who did neuroscience and had an open source um, library for well essentially he wanted to control he wanted to control things using brainwaves so it was you know so I think they had to do a lot of this type of recognition that you're doing so it might be interesting as you're going through to kind of look at, at uh, the neuro center at uh, SUNY Albany um, there's some there's some really interesting activities in this area going on there as well. Okay, thank you. So that wasn't really a question, but <laughs> I think I think you would find it useful, um, and and, and uh, kind of kind of uh, interesting. All right, thank you. Very nice, very nicely done. Um, we have Kian M. Are you there? And then uh, Kog Kog K. You are on deck. All right, I'm gonna share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, the deep blue, a, a Minecraft dimension uh, mod. There's always a Minecraft mod. You guys are <laughs> are uh, are diligent. There is quite a bit of Minecraft mods, and like almost all of them are open source, so it's a pretty good project. All right. Yep. So I'm Andrew, and I'm working with Trevor Mac, Ayush, and Steven. And the open source project that we're going to be developing is a mod for the game Minecraft, and it's centered around adding an underwater dimension to the game. Uh, our project plan is to add this dimension, which the player can travel to and explore. Uh, here we've listed out the core parts of the mod up on top, uh, as well as the features that aren't so necessary, but we would definitely like to get to and include. The project itself can be found on GitHub, and it uses the MIT license. This is because our aim is to make the mod see as much use as possible, and the MIT license gives users the most freedom. Uh, we use the Forge modding API, which is a very common API for Minecraft mods. Uh, we plan to make separate branches for integrating major features of the mod, uh, with our group members having right access to everything. Uh, outside contributors can make pull requests, though. Currently, we've set up our development environments uh, using IntelliJ and Eclipse, and we've configured a basic mod. We push this mod to the GitHub repo, and we confirm that it can be cloned and built on each of our local machines. All right. Uh, so we started assigning tasks to separate group members. Uh, so these are the ones we're all currently working on. Each of them are relatively independent of each other, meaning that none of the features is really blocked by any other features completion. Uh, here's a screenshot from Minecraft, which is running the blank mod that we've configured. Uh, if you clone the repo and build the mod, you can find our mod in the game's mod list. So you can see it here. Uh, it shows our names, uh, our GitHub repo link, uh, and our license over here. And there's a brief description tool. All right. Thank you very much for listening. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in chat. Anything? So uh, one thing I'm going to throw out there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you you I, I like the way you're proceeding. You started off with a blank mod. You made sure everybody can can uh, download and and build it. Um, you ever thought about automating that? Can you write an automated test to 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 build? Um, you mean like in GitHub? Well, you know, if you if you write one that you can execute, right? If you if you can put your build steps into a make file or into a CMake file, um, then you also should be able to automate it on GitHub, which is where I was getting to. Um, oh, I see right. what you're saying. So, so if you I'm can sure do an automated works. test that, that builds your mod and, and, it, and ensures that it works, that's really all you need to do a, a smoke test or a thread test uh, on, on GitHub, just a, just a, you know, a simple you know, compatibility, compatibility checker. And every time you guys push or, or contribute to the repo, um, it can set you up to uh, to 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 run the the, the tests and, and make sure that everything's working, and that's the start of you know what could be a very big and uh, and complex uh, testing project. Um, so just, maybe before like pull requests, like before we merge those, we can have a check to make sure they'll build. Exactly, that's exactly what the what the what the what the hope would be. So anyway, I just thought I would throw that out. Um, any any other questions? I guess that wasn't really a question. Well, it was a question. I asked you if you can if you can automate the build. That's a question. Um, any other questions out there? All right. 
Thank you, Andrew. Um, nice, nice job. Let's see. Do we have... Okay, so that was Mac Kion. Kogic, um, UK. We've got a raised hand. Yes, you are invited. And I think I've already had a preview of yours, if I'm not mistaken. And then following this, it'll be Hotop B. And then uh, we will we will uh, end up with A Sharp P. Would will be our our last uh, our last uh, person, our last project. I can see you here, Kevin. Are you able to? Uh, are you able to? Uh, there we go. OSS project update week two. Kevin Kagani. Kagani yes. is, that, is that close? Cool. Okay, good. Good. That is correct. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin, and I guess I'm going to be delivering a sort of week out of date update on what I've been working on for the <laughs> MIDI team. Now, we all know what Submiti is, as far as I, I'm going to assume. We've used it for open source software, after all, for the test. There are, it's just me, basically, on the Submiti team this semester. But you can also work on Submiti through Arcos, which I am actually simultaneously doing. And there are 10 to 12 developers there that I've met personally. Submiti is pretty big, and you can see some graphs here, actually, from our lab three together. And you can see that it dates from 2014 onwards, and there's been a lot of commits through a very, very managed, highly managed pull request and merge system. As for the code base, uh, the front end, which is what I have been working on so far, is made up of PHP, Twig, JavaScript, and HTML, and there are some other languages on the back end as well. Before I move on to the next slide, or, well, we'll see, I want to add a little bit more that I'm going to talk about as well. But let's talk about the bug that I have been dealing with in week two and continuing into week three. I'm going to call this the version mismatch bug, because this, the screenshot at the top, is what I've been able to reproduce very recently, actually. And I showed the professor this already. This is actually the OSS test that I just mentioned a slide ago. It turns out that even if you only have one version of the exam, occasionally you will have a bug where it says, rather than this version will be graded, please wait. It will say something along the lines of, this version is actually not the version graded by the instructor or TAs, when in fact it is, and it's sort of just out of sync for some reason. So that's what I'm investigating. It turns out that this is actually a little bit old of a bug. Unfortunately, I have a little pop-up here. So, okay, yeah, September 2020. Bugs in Submitty sometimes take a while to get finished, just because as semesters go by, occasionally students graduate, and a bug sometimes gets skipped over. But the good news is there are always new students coming into Submitty. Enter me. And that's what I've been working on. So how do you work on a bug in Submitty? Well, there's a first step. And sadly here, I would have updated the slides by now. But the way it works is there is a virtual machine. Once you clone all the files from GitHub, you can actually launch a, a vagrant virtual machine. And this allows you to go to a website called localhost and actually launch your own version of Submitty. And then you can look into all of these sample files, etc and start playing around with gradables. So that's how you could reproduce this bug. But before I would reproduce a bug like this, I would like to understand how it works. And thankfully, we all have the code at our fingertips, so we can find messages just using search, basically, more or less. And this is the actual error message inside, I believe this is, this is a twig file? It must have been. So this is the error message in question. And you can actually see the exact conditions attached to it. In this case, it's asking if the active version is the same as graded, if it's not, and if it has a manual grading. So that's good to know. We know for the fact that the OSS test had manual grading. Not all of it was auto-graded. So why would not active same as graded be true? Or you know, to rephrase that, why is active same as graded false? And that's the new trail that I would follow up. And that's how you would follow code and begin trying to solve this problem. Then you would change some if statements, see if it works, push it to the your own little local virtual machine, and continue testing. And that's where I was at around week two. Any questions? Ha <laughs> ha. 
Uh, sorry about that. I was muted. Um, so oh, okay. <laughs> I was asking a, a very insightful question. Um, so you didn't put in a back door that allows you always to get hundreds, right? No, I got that question a few times, actually. And it's it's the joke that everybody likes to joke exactly. about. Exactly. Yep. But as far as I can tell, there's no such way that allows me to just give myself an elevated permission. I'm pretty sure the permissions are located on the back end, yeah, which is something I probably could begin to play around with, but I haven't been given any back end, back end issues yet. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I will say that I won't do it because, man, <laughs> it would be so easy for them to catch me. Again, I get, I didn't, I talked about this just a little bit, but there's a very detailed. I'm sure you've. I don't know if we're going to talk about it actually, but just going with pull requests and like specific tests you can add to all of them, they will see the exact lines I change. They will notice. Oh, look, he went into the permissions and gave himself instructor mode. That's not supposed to be the case. We're going to have to close this pull request and maybe expel you from RPI. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yes, that that's one of the reasons. Um, we we probably won't go into it too much. We probably should. Huh, I got to think about this. Um, but yeah, uh, almost every project I've worked on uh, over time has had uh, a second set of eyes. And it's not just to keep people from from giving themselves elevated permissions on Submitty. Um, but you catch a lot of bugs by having uh, at least one other person uh, go through and, and review your, your commits before before uh, they get pushed out. Uh, you, you catch a lot of stupid errors that, that, should, you, know, that you just missed uh and oftentimes by um th they'll often go in not necessarily as uh as the person looking for critical bugs but as the person who uh who's asking you questions about why you did things in a certain way and that actually is is you know generally it's you that finds the bugs after somebody else has questioned you in a probing way about something that you've done so anyway uh that would be actually be a good module to to cover I'll have to see if we can fit it in at some point. But I'm thinking that probably not for this year, although we'll find out. All right. Um, next. By the way, I'm well, I'll am talk about that at the end of this. Next group is um, Hotop B and then uh, Asharp P will be the, the one immediately following. So uh, are either or both of you around? Okay, let's start with uh with uh Prasant. I am inviting you to the stage and we will look for uh Hotop B to show up in the interim. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so Fast Food Database is a project that uh, the idea for it came last year, I think, when actually, yeah, last last summer, when Taco Bell removed a menu item that me and Sean really liked. Um, we wanted to track fast food prices because uh, the prices are actually per restaurant. So, for example, um, one McDonald's will have a different dollar menu than a than a McDonald's in a different location. And the only place this information exists right now is like uh, Grubhub or Uber Eats. Um, and both of these things, all these food delivery services don't have public APIs. Um, and Google Maps has the restaurant data, but they don't have the granular menu item data or historic menu item data. So something that we'd be interested in tracking is how the price of the menu items changes over time. Um, so this is what we want to do. We want to make a Postgres database that gives granular menu item data. This is like a, a rough idea of what our database schema would look like. So basically we have one table that has the menu item data, and then we have a uh, a table that has the restaurant data, and then other tables that can track things like um, how trustworthy is the how trustworthy is each menu item data, or 
who contributed each menu item data. And the reason we want to track who contributes is because the whole idea is that you can contribute data from your location. So you don't need an account or anything. You can just go to the website. There'll be a form. You can fill it out and upload some information. Um, one thing that we are looking for feedback about that we don't know how to fix or handle right now is how can we make sure that the user contributed data is not garbage. So uh, I looked around a lot and the best example I found was Wikipedia. They do like, a, it's like basically what this is. So they have moderators that will adopt pages and make sure that people don't grief. Um, but the problem with that is that it would just be me and Sean. So if a lot of menu item data was coming in, we'd have to manually review every single one, which would take a long time. So last week we made our GitHub repo. Uh, we added the basic structure. So we have uh, all the normal things that an open source repo will have. Uh, we chose the MIT license because we wanted the most permissive license possible. Um, and we communicate with one another using Discord. Um, we also set up a project email. So if someone wants to message the contributors, they can just message that email. We also set up our local development environments. So that means both of us installed Rust. Uh, both of us set up Postgres database to hold the information. And we are using Vue for the front end, so we both set up NPM on our machines. Uh, that's pretty much it. Cool. So we've got two, so we've got two uh, questions fast already. Fast food. Yeah, yeah. You, you can read the chat as well as I can, I guess. You want to you wanna handle those? Sure. Uh, let me read the chat. Delivery services have been known to modify the price so they don't match what you get in store. Are you accounting for that at all? Uh, I know McDonald's and many others have an official app too. So the idea is that the users upload the, the data. So it's not actually coming from Grubhub or Uber Eats. So the data on the website will reflect what you see when you go to the, the drive through and look at the menu. Um, I think that's a great idea. We, we could maybe add a flag to the menu item entries to denote like, oh, this one is from Grubhub. This one is from Uber Eats for a specific location. Cool. Uh, have you seen that website? Tells you? Oh yeah, I've seen that website. It's awesome. And I should look at that, yeah. And I think the $64,000 question is, was the quesarito the item they took off the menu that you loved? <sighs> No, it was actually the shredded chicken quesadilla. Ah, gotcha. But I know people are also really upset about the <laughs> the pizza, okay. the Mexican pizza. <laughs> For shot, why don't you uh, why, uh, why don't you uh, start sharing? And, and while you do, I'm gonna just say uh, I have uh, that website. Oh, that's that's for the uh, the, the machine. Um, so one thing you can do is uh, you can have layers of uh, of uh, if you replace your prices with your your modular price with an error bar, you could have people who are trusted, right? Which would be you and Sean to begin with, uh, and and they would yep. have either you know as uh, you know a line as opposed to a, uh, error bars. But you could also have people who have contributed previously, and as people contribute accurate information, uh, they get to be they get they acquire levels of trust, and that can be reflected in the error bar or in in coloring or, or something like that, you know, so you could have, a, uh, you know, for one thing, if you get enough people reporting just by crowdsourcing, you're generally going to get the right answer, right? If you use like the, the, yeah. the, the median, uh, or the other, or the mode value, you'll probably get the, the right mm -hmm. answer. It will change over time though. And that's where you're, you know, you, you're going to miss at the transitions. But the other thing you can do is you can just mark things as being more or less, uh, accurate depending on who, you know, who's contributed right last. so like associate the trust with the the people contributing and not the item so much right yeah exactly 
Um, there's also a gas app that does this, by the way, which is kind of cool. Um, I don't know that it's Sounds open nice. source or anything, but you can, you can, if you subscribe to it, you can get the gas prices all around. Uh, all right. Prasant, are you coming on? Yep. Are you on? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I'm not seeing your, your, your screen is my screen right now. There you go. Oh, uh, all right. There we go. So here we go. Here's my project. So uh, it's called Miso. Um, and you can kind of think of it as almost like a YouTube DL for graphic novels. Um, as for the name, uh, I just found it in like a random name generator. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So just that. Uh, kind of the origins is uh, it started out as sort of a personal project, you could say, over winter break. Uh, so a different server, a, dis a different Discord server I'm in, uh, did this kind of book club, you could kind of think. Um, but like not everybody had access to all the books, but there were like chapters of uh, them online. So I basically made like a little scraper uh, um, to, you know, just like grab the books or the chapters so that way everybody could read. Um, and I'm looking to basically revamp it more or less for uh, this semester. So it started out as just like one site uh, and only able to grab like a few chapters. I'm hoping to basically um, move it so that way it's a little bit more um, clean, I'd say. So that way it's more of like a scraping library that you can use for multiple different sites rather than just like one site and possibly adding in some APIs as well. Uh, since I know that um, there's a few sites out there, like uh, I know XKCD has like an API where you can access his web comics. So things like that, I'd want to add to it too. So the tech stack that I kind of have uh, at the moment is it's written in Node.js and we're going to be using Puppeteer for most of the web scraping or that's what we did use. Um, and some of the milestones. So one, I already had, uh, you can say, sort of a functioning product uh, or barely functioning product at the time, uh, but the code base was pretty messy. It was basically just like scripts thrown around all over the place. So one of the main goals is to reorganize the code. Uh, and I've already done that to a great extent. So this is more or less done. Um, others would be like adding new sites to the pool to scrape um, and things like that. Uh, adding APIs for particular sites. Another option that I wanted uh, was basically different download options. So at the moment, it basically creates like a giant folder of PNG or a giant folder of just PNGs um, for each of the chapters, basically. Uh, but I'd love to have like different download options. So for example, you can have like a PDF, uh, so you can open up uh, open up the chapter in like a PDF viewer, or like a CBR, which is uh, I think it stands for like comic book RAR, uh, which is like a RAR or archive file for um, uh, an archive file of like PNGs more or less. Another one is to add like a proper CLI interface, since at the moment it's just like a, a script basically that you would run in your command line. Um, so those are sort of the milestones, uh, the objective, etc. cetera. Uh, any questions? Any questions? So uh, you've, uh, you've looked into some, some of the scraping apps, right? Some of the scraping technologies? Yeah, uh, a little bit. So Good. Um, I'm looking into Puppeteer more or less. Okay. Um, yeah, which is, um, it functions as, uh, from the way I understand it, it functions almost like a headless Chrome. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was also looking into Selenium, but Puppeteer seems a lot more um, uh, easier to use than Selenium. And also, um, from what I've read like online, uh, Puppeteer's version for Node is better than Selenium's uh, for Node. Okay. So that's kind of the uh, reason why I went with it. All right. Any other questions? I think uh, uh, Eli says you should also check out Cyprus or Cyprus. I guess it depends what part of the country you're from. Um, mm, as right. as another as another option. Uh, I think the package remains the same, but how you pronounce it changes depending on where you are. All right, I think you were it. Is anybody else here who hasn't presented? Speak now or forever hold your peas.
All right. Um, if somebody hasn't presented, I know there's one group who hasn't presented um, and, and maybe one other person. Um, you know, please contact me. We will get you in, but we need to get this need to get this wrapped up. Um, I'm going to apologize to the first three groups. Um, I did not record your slides uh, because I did not turn my recording to record the correct screen. Um, that said, you should be, um, you know, please post your, your slides and, uh, and your, your voices were recorded so people can go through and, and use the slides. I'm not going to make you do it again. Um, I think that we will uh, kind of end this for now. Uh, any questions before we move on? I am so looking forward to uh, being able to talk again and not have to be concerned about where my camera is pointing or anything else that's annoying. Um, so we will hopefully get back to that as soon as possible, although not this semester. All right. Um, I am probably 